So in this experiment, we're going to cover activity 2-14, talking about disinfectants and antiseptics. And so we're going to start out with how we would set up this experiment. And so the way we would do this is you guys would do this in groups of four. And per group of four, you would need this, these items. You would need three nutrient auger plates. You would need sterile blanks. These are these little filter discs that actually would be shared um, between six students. You would need three sterile swabs. You would need three sterile forceps. You would have a, a well plate, so what we call a, um, a depression plate, one per group. And then a set of four control agents, meaning four different chemicals that you want to test for their effectiveness against bacteria. Because in this experiment, we want to see how well these disinfectants or antiseptics work against different types of bacteria. And so in this experiment, you would test four different chemicals. You would also need one set of cultures. There are three bacteria that you would be testing. You would be testing Staphylococcus aureus, Escherichia coli, and Bacillus megatherium. And for B. megatherium, it's actually a spore culture because remember that Bacillus produces endospores. And so in a little bit, I'll talk more about why we chose these three organisms. So this experiment would be done in groups of three or four. And so the way that this would work is, remember I said that you would need three plates. You would take those three plates and one plate, you would make a swab of Bacillus megatherium. So this would be a liquid culture and you would take your sterile swab and you would dip it in the bacteria and then you would swab the entire plate. So back and forth, back and forth, all across the plate to distribute the bacteria all across the plate. You would do this for all three organisms. So you would have one plate that has Bacillus megatherium, you would have one plate that has Staph aureus, and you would have one plate that has E. coli. So you would have three plates that you've swabbed with three different bacteria. After you make your lawn and you swab the bacteria all over the plate, then you're gonna take your four chemicals that you're testing. So in this plate, you can see that the, the chemicals I would be testing would be Listerine, Lysol, bleach, and tea tree oil. And so what I would do is I would divide my plate into four quadrants and I would label them with the chemical that I'm testing. So notice my plate is labeled. I've also labeled my plate with my organism, my initials, and then my lab day and time. So this is how my plate would be labeled. So when I do my lawn and I swab my whole plate, then I'm going to take these discs, and these discs are basically little filter papers, and they're going to be soaked in the various chemicals. So one disc would be soaked in, le in Listerine. And then that disc that's been soaked in Listerine would be put on the plate. And then one disc would be soaked in Lysol. And then that disc would be put on the plate. Same thing with the tea tree oil, and same thing with the bleach. And so once you put those discs that are soaked in chemicals on your plate, then you would take that plate and you would put it in a 37 degree incubator and we would incubate for 48 hours. And then we would look at the results after 48 hours. So this is just showing you what the procedure would look like in terms of how to soak these discs. So what we would do is you would have this depression plate and you'll notice that it has these little wells. And so what we would do is we would take our chemicals and we would add it to the wells. So again, of my four chemicals that I'm testing, I would put one well that has Listerine, one that has Lysol, one that has tea tree, and one that has bleach. Now, when you guys would do this experiment in class, we would say don't write on your plate directly because we don't want that marking to be on there permanently. And so we would actually put a paper towel underneath and then label on the paper towel. So we would add the chemical to the appropriate well. For some chemicals, we would use a plastic transfer pipette to try and transfer the liquid into the wells. Then once you do that, once you get your chemicals in all your wells, you would again get out your sterile swab and then take your sterile swab and dip it in the bacterial solution. So again, for this plate, it would be E. coli. So I would dip it in the tube that says E. coli. 
and I would take that swab and rub the excess liquid off the swab on the inside of the tube. I wouldn't want my swab to be dripping wet because if it is dripping wet, it's gonna leak bacteria as I go to transfer it. Again, then you would take that swab that's covered in bacteria and you would swab your plate to make a lawn. Again, that means you would cover the entire plate so that it's covered completely with that bacteria. Then you would use your tweezers that your group has and you would take your sterile disc and you would add it to the appropriate chemical. So again, you're going to then take it, dip it in the Listerine and then take that sterile disc that was, that was in the Listerine and you would add it to the plate. You would want to make sure that you don't touch the forceps or the tweezers um, to the plate because remember the plate is going to have bacteria on it and we don't want to contaminate those uh, forceps or tweezers. So you would just drop the disc on there and let it sit on the plate. In between, you would rinse those tweezers with tap water and then repeat with the various chemicals. So then you would take a disc and dip it in the Lysol and then put that disc on the plate. Rinse them off, get another disc, put it in the tea tree. Same thing over and over for all of your chemicals that are tested. Once you add those discs, then you would turn your plate auger side up, because remember we always incubate our plates auger side up, and you would put that plate in the incubator at 37 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. So now we're gonna talk about what we would do on day two for our readout. So to understand this experiment, we need a few terms. So the first term is gonna be a disinfectant. And a disinfectant is a chemical that kills and reduces microbial populations on inanimate objects, meaning things that are not living. So like on a desk, for example, or if you were to wipe down your phone, right? Those are non-living things. That would be considered a disinfectant. An antiseptic would be a chemical that kills and reduces microbial populations on living tissues. So that would be like using antibacterial um, hand sanitizer, for example, right? That's on living tissue. So that would be an antiseptic. So disinfectants on non-living surfaces, antiseptics are on living surfaces. Now, if you think about it, are all chemicals both a disinfectant and an antiseptic? And the answer is no, right? Not all chemicals could be used in both cases. Some things are safe to use on a counter, for example, like Lysol, but I wouldn't want to spray my wound with Lysol. Right, And so some chemicals could potentially be both, um, but there are definitely instances where sometimes a chemical is just a disinfectant, sometimes a chemical is just an antiseptic, um, or they could be both. But they have different terms depending on if they're used on living tissues or on inanimate objects. And so that's the difference when you hear the terms disinfectants and antiseptics. So what you would do is after you set up your experiment and you put your plate in the incubator for 48 hours. When you get your plate out, you'll notice that your plate has a lawn. All this cloudiness, all this turbidity is the bacteria that's growing on the plate. And so what you would see in this case, in this experiment, this disc was soaked in Listerine, this one was soaked in honey, this one was soaked in ammonia, and this one was soaked in pine salt. And so what you would do in this experiment to see if this chemical is effective to inhibit microbial growth is you would measure the clearing from the edge of the disc to the edge of the clear zone. So if you notice for this one for pine salt, for example, here's the edge of the disc and to the edge of the clearing. And so you would measure this distance and we would measure this in millimeters. Now, if we have more than two millimeters of clearing, meaning our clear zone is large, we would record that as being sensitive. So in this case, when I look at Bacillus megatherium, B. megatherium is sensitive to pine salt. That means that pine salt is effective 
in inhibiting microbial growth because we don't see growth around this disc. If we see less than two millimeters of clearing, we would call that resistant. So notice that for Listerine, the bacteria grew right up next to that disc. The bacteria is resistant to Listerine. Listerine is not working effectively to inhibit microbial growth. The bacteria grew right up next to it. Same thing with honey, same thing with the ammonia. Notice it grows right up next to that disc. So we would record that Bacillus megatherium is resistant to Listerine, to honey, to ammonia, but it's sensitive to pine salt. And so if you were doing this in class, you would take your three organisms and you tested all the same chemicals on all three organisms and you would record whether or not the bacteria is sensitive or resistant to that chemical. So here's an example experiment. In this experiment, this was tested with, again, E. coli, Staph aureus, and Bacillus megatherium. Now, the reason these organisms are chosen is for a specific reason. If you think about gram reaction, for example, is E. coli gram negative or gram positive? And the answer is E. coli is gram negative. Staph aureus would be an example of a gram positive. So we're testing both a gram negative and a gram positive. Bacillus megatherium is gram positive also, but we chose this for a different reason. And remember that that's because in this experiment, the Bacillus megatherium that we're using is an endospore culture. So we're using an endospore producing bacteria to see how effective the chemicals are against that endospore producing bacteria. So what we have is disc number one is soaked in hydrogen peroxide. And what you'll notice by looking at this Hydrogen peroxide is very effective. Notice it's extremely effective. In all three cases, it inhibited microbial growth. It inhibited E. coli, it inhibited Staph aureus, it inhibited Bacillus megatherium. If we look at white vinegar, so here is the white vinegar. Here it is, here it is. You'll notice that there is some effectiveness right, but definitely not to the extent that the hydrogen peroxide have. If I were to measure this, then I could record whether this was sensitive or resistant. However, without a ruler on here, it's difficult to determine whether it's sensitive or resistant. Uh, for Bacillus megatherium, the bacteria grew right up to the disc, so this would be um, resistant. You'll notice there's kind of this clearing um, and then there's a little bit of growth, that might be due to the fact that it's an endospore producing bacteria. So it may have inhibited at some point, but then the bacteria may have grown into that area. But still, you'll notice there's no clearing, therefore the bacteria is gonna be resistant. This one here, there is some zone of inhibition, there is some clearing. So uh, white vinegar might have um, some effectiveness against Staph aureus, but again, not as much um, for the E. coli. For disc number three, that is bathroom cleaner. You'll notice that the bathroom cleaner is effective in all cases. It's effective for the E. coli, for the Staph aureus, and the B. megatherium. And thankfully, it's very effective against E. coli, which you would hope so, because if it's a bathroom cleaner, and let's say it's to clean the toilet, the toilet is likely to be infected or have a lot of E. coli present because E. coli would be found in fecal matter. So it's a really good thing that this bathroom cleaner is effective at inhibiting E. coli. So that's a good thing. If we look at the mouthwash, this doesn't say which mouthwash. There are different types and the different mouthwashes have different active ingredients, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but what you'll see is that in this case, uh, the mouthwash was not effective against E. coli. The E. coli was resistant to that mouthwash. Now, why might that be important? Well, one thing to consider is that if you have a bathroom where your toilet is next to where you keep your toothbrush, for example, right, and you flush the toilet and you aerosolize some of that fecal matter, you could end up with E. coli 
um, on your toothbrush or on other things that you might put in your mouth. So just something to think about that you want to try and keep your toothbrush away from your toilet so that you don't end up with fecal bacteria on your toothbrush. If we look at Staph aureus and Bacillus megatherium, we do see some clearing, but again, without a ruler on there to determine if that's more or less than two millimeters, I can't say conclusively just looking at this whether that is sensitive or resistant, but I can say it has some effectiveness. And so this would be how we would analyze these plates. So in the next slide or so, I'm going to discuss the results of different experiments that I've done with my, my students in different semesters so that you can see what some of this data would look like. So before we talk about that though, I do wanna talk a minute about the way that microbial control agents work, meaning how do they interfere with microbial growth? And so some of the chemicals that we use work by disruption of the cell membrane because if they dissolve the cell membrane, for example, for living cells, well, then that bacteria is no longer living and no longer can um, cause issues or, or cause infection. Some chemicals work by denaturation of proteins and or interference in enzymatic function. So remember that denaturation of proteins means that the proteins unfold and if proteins unfold, then they don't work properly. And therefore, if those proteins don't work properly, then bacteria can't function properly. Remember that when we do our heat fix step, for example, when we're making our heat fix smear, that the purpose of the heat fix is to denature those proteins. And when we denature those proteins, it kills the bacteria and it adheres the bacteria to the slide. So notice that in this case, the way some of these control agents work is that they denature proteins. And if they denature proteins, that will kill the bacteria and therefore the bacteria cannot grow and reproduce. Some chemicals work by damage to nucleic acids. So they damage the nucleic acids. Some work by destruction by free radicals. So you might recall that when we talked about the effect of um, oxygen on bacterial growth, that there are these reactive oxygen species, these types of oxygen that are highly reactive, and they work by stealing electrons. And so one of the ways that some of these control agents work is by producing these free radicals, which make the bacteria unstable. And so these are just some of the ways that these chemicals might work to disrupt or to control microbial growth. So this is a table from a previous semester. This is showing the data that my class has gotten in the past. And so let's look at what this data means. So these chemicals are discussed in more detail in chapter nine of your textbook. Um, but we're going to keep this very simple for the simplicity of this experiment. So the first category that could be tested in this experiment is the biguanide. And so an example of that would be chlorhexidine. And chlorhexidine is used for several purposes. Um, it is used in mop cleaner. Um, it's also used on skin in vet clinics, for example. Um, and the way that this chemical um, inhibits microbial growth is that it disrupts the cell membrane. Now in this experiment, we didn't have any students test any of the chlorhexidine, and so we don't have data for that. Next, we have alcohol. And so the way that this works in terms of this table is I went ahead and I color-coded the chemical. So Listerine, for example, is in yellow. And so the data that goes with it is also in yellow. Rubbing alcohol 70% is in black. So you can see it here in black. 90% rubbing alcohol is in green. Um, hand sanitizer at 60% is in red. Scope, again, it depends on the type of scope. Um, there are different formulations of different types of mouthwash and they can vary in terms of their active ingredients. You'll notice that Crest mouthwash, for example, is not in the alcohol category. It's actually in the quaternary ammonium ion category. 
And so different mouthwashes have different categories. They have different active ingredients. But in the ones that were tested here, in the purple, the scope is going to be an alcohol, and this generic mouthwash is going to be in the blue. The way that the alcohols work is that they work in two main ways. Um, they disrupt the cell membrane, and they also denature the proteins. And so that's the way that they control microbial growth. So if you look at this table and you look at the data, what might be a little bit shocking to you is that if you look at this, you'll notice that you see a lot of Rs. You see a lot of resistance, right? So if we look at Bacillus megatherium, it's really only sensitive to the hand sanitizer and to the scope, but resistant to everything else. If we look at Staph aureus, Staph aureus is a little more sensitive. It's sensitive to the hand sanitizer, to the 90% alcohol, and to the scope. If I look at E. coli, E. coli is sensitive to the hand sanitizer. Um, it's sensitive to the 70% rubbing alcohol, the 90% rubbing alcohol, etc. Now, when you're studying this, you will not be asked to memorize this data. That is not the point of this. This point is just to show you, basically, how bacteria respond to these different chemicals. And so again, you don't have to memorize this data, but it is kind of cool, and it is fun when we're in person for you guys to get to choose to test whatever chemicals you want to use. It could be chemicals that you use around your house and you want to see if they're effective. This is a really fun experiment to do in person because you get to test things that you're interested in. Um, so don't worry about memorizing all this data. That's not the point. I just wanted to show you what this data would look like. So again, if you look at the alcohols, one of the things that you might notice is that you see a lot of R's you see a lot of resistance. And remember that if we say that the bacteria is resistant to that chemical, it means that that chemical is not very effective against that bacteria. So that might surprise you, right? Because for example, we're in a pandemic and we're talking about you know using hand sanitizer. And you might go, well, it doesn't seem to be that effective. But what you have to realize is that in this experiment, the way that we do this experiment actually does affect the results to an extent. And the reason is, is that alcohol, remember, evaporates really quickly. So when we take our plates and we stick them in our 37 degree incubator, right, that warm temperature, which is like 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is human body temperature, that elevated temperature is going to cause the alcohol to evaporate quickly. And when it does that, when it evaporates and it, and it evaporates off of the disc, well, now the bacteria can grow into where that disc was, where that clear zone may have been. So one of the things that you want to be aware is that, yes, it looks like alcohols are not very effective, but it could be simply due to the way that we do our experiment because we let them sit in the incubator for 48 hours and a lot of the alcohol could evaporate off in that time period, which then allows the bacteria to grow right up next to that disc. So just something to keep in mind when you're looking at this data. If we look at what we call quats, quats are quaternary ammonium ions. And the way that these quaternary ammonium ions work is that they work by disruption to the cell membrane. And so you would find um, quaternary ammonium ions. Um, some examples would be like Lysol, for example. Um, Lysol is um, pretty effective, for example, against the coronavirus. Um, barbicide, which we didn't test in this experiment. We have Bactine, we have Crest mouthwash. Um, in this experiment, we tested a disinfectant spray, a Pine Sol, Simple Green, and a scope mouthwash. Again, depends on the formulation of scope. So quaternary ammonium ions, they look, they're a detergent, they look very similar to the cell membrane, and so they disrupt the cell membrane, and that will kill the bacterial cells. And so if we look at this data, you'll notice that Lysol is fairly effective. There is one group's data that for one reason or another, they got resistant in every case, but 
notice there are five groups that tested this and four of the five say that it's sensitive. So I would count that R as probably some anomaly with somebody's experiment because everybody else that tested it saw that the bacteria was sensitive to the lysol. The lysol was actually fairly effective in inhibiting microbial growth. If we look at the Crest mouthwash, notice that Staph aureus is sensitive to it. Um, however, B. megatherium and E. coli, we see one of each, one sensitive and one resistant. If we look at Simple Green or Bactine, um, you'll notice that in both cases, all the bacteria is sensitive to that. For the scope mouthwash, um, Bacillus megatherium is sensitive, E. coli is sensitive, but Staph aureus is resistant. And then for the disinfectant spray, it's sensitive in all cases. The pine saw was not very effective. Notice that it was resistant in every case. So this is just to show you some different data for this. If we get to our halogens, our halogens work by one of three methods. They actually are very effective. They, their action of control is by producing free radicals, um, disruption to the cell membrane, as well as denaturation of proteins. And so our halogens are going to be these oxidizing agents. They kill by oxidation or stealing electrons. And this leads to destruction of cellular components, which inhibits microbial growth. So some halogens would include things like um, iodine, chloride components, uh, fluorine. So if we look at our halogens, some examples of some halogens would be our bleach, 3%. We have an ultra bleach, which is 6%. We have a Lysol toilet bowl cleaner, which has a 2% halogen. Betadine, um, a povidone iodine. We have Clorox germicidal wipes. And so what you'll notice is that for the most part, they are very effective. The iodine did have two resistance, but again, another group saw that it was sensitive. So it's, it's difficult to say what this is for these two R's, but notice that for this category as a whole, notice that it's very effective. And we saw that in the example plates that we looked at. Um, those are very, very effective chemicals because the bathroom cleaner would be an example of a halogen. And you'll notice that if you look back at those pictures that the bathroom cleaner was fairly effective. So that's the way that the halogens work. If we look at the peroxygens, peroxygens also, their method of action is by free radicals. Again, they kill by oxidation and stealing of electrons. And so for our peroxygens, generally they're going to, um, they're gonna have hydrogen peroxide in them. So there were several examples of chemicals that were tested this way. Uh, Clorox Greenworks works this way, Clorox Healthcare Wipes work this way, as well as a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution. And what you'll notice is that in all cases, bacteria are sensitive to these peroxygens. And so this is very effective. If we look back at our data, our pictures of the plates, you'll notice that the hydrogen peroxide was extremely effective. And so again, if we look at number one, look at how large these zones of inhibition are. Look how large these clearing are. These chemicals were extremely effective at controlling microbial growth. And so that would be for hydrogen peroxide. In this experiment, some groups might test other types of chemicals. Um, so tea tree oil, which is melaleuca, um, Windex, which um, contains lactic acid, there are multiple different types of chemicals that could be used, and they work by various mechanisms, but in this particular experiment, nobody tested those. So this is just to show you what some of this data would look like. Again, you are not going to be asked to memorize this table. It's just more kind of for your information so that you can see which types of chemicals are going to be effective. If I look at another semester's data, 
here is what we see. So again, this is more handwritten, but you get the idea. I tried to color code this. Um, and so you can see a very similar thing. Notice that the peroxygens, again, are very, very effective. Um, if we look at the contact lens solution, which is this green down here, it's not very effective. Um, the vinegar was not very effective. Notice it was resistant. Um, the toilet bowl cleaner that contained lactic acid, um, that one is not very effective. It did inhibit um, Bacillus megatherium, but it was not effective against Staph aureus or E. coli. Now, one thing to think about for Bacillus megatherium. Notice that you see quite a bit of S's, and you might think, well, you know, Bacillus megatherium is an endospore producing bacteria. Why is it so sensitive to these chemicals? Well, what you have to remember is that when bacteria experience these chemicals or when they come in contact with these chemicals, for Bacillus megatherium, what structure is it going to form as a result of this harsh condition? It's going to form an endospore. So while you might see this zone of inhibition, this clear zone, what you need to realize, though, is that that just means that the bacteria is inhibited. It doesn't mean that the chemical killed Bacillus megatherium. All it did in this case might have been, might have been, to inhibit its growth, meaning that there's endospores in that clear zone. It didn't kill the bacteria, but it did inhibit it. And so that's why we see quite a bit of S's um, in terms of Bacillus megatherium. They may be sensitive, but that's because they may form endospores in response to this chemical. And so again, this is just showing you more data for you to kind of see how the how these chemicals are or are not um, effective against bacterial growth. And so I have one more that you can look at for the data. And so here is another set of data that we have here. And again, they're color coded. And so again, you can see which of these chemicals are effective or not. Again, the hydrogen peroxide, the peroxygens are very effective. Notice it's sensitive in every case. Um, if we look at our quaternary ammonium ions, for the most part, they're effective except this one contact lens solution. Um, but everything else was fairly sensitive, et cetera. And so this would be our disinfectants and antiseptics experiment. And so this would be how we would test how effective these disinfectants or antiseptics are.